Hey guys, what's going on? Steve, I'm back again, and I'm back with another 40k video from Wes Hammer. And the topic for today's video is the darkest units in 40k part one. I have no idea what these units are. What makes these units the darkest? Is it their abilities? Is it how you become or join, I guess, said unit? Or is it just some like back, background lore stories and stuff like that? Oh, this unit snuck aboard the ship or something like that and killed all the occupants of the ship in like this grim, dark, you know, way. Like they went in, dismembered everybody, and then kind of like reassembled them, you know, like killed the captain and dismembered him but then kind of like reassembled him and stuck him back in the captain's chair so like anybody going by oh okay you know captain's there y you know what i mean i i don't know it's just my guess that'd be pretty terrifying um but yeah let's uh let's let's find out what these darkest units are here we go if there's one thing that you can say about Warhammer 40k, it's that it's definitely not lacking for horrifying and grotesque aliens, demons, and monsters. Right. Each new Eldritch Abomination you encounter is somehow even more terrifying than the last. And as a massive fan of all things spooky, I'm all for it. Yeah, I'm I enjoy your spooky you, videos. It's to the point now where even mundane and seemingly normal things have a secret terrifying backstory. Even creatures that seem... I don't know, cute, are secretly designed to kill you in the most horrific ways imaginable. Now, I'll really? fully admit it, talking about the creepy and dark side of 40k never gets old to me. So I want to kick off a new series nah, I always where enjoy we talk those about videos. the most disturbing units that can be found throughout the lore. But okay. specifically ones that are utilized by major playable factions. These are creatures that you may have seen okay. as models in the tabletop game. I'm down for this new series. Or a piece of artwork depicting them floating around on the internet. But you don't really know what they're all about. So for this video, I've gathered together five of the darkest units in 40k that you need to know about. We're going to talk about a unit of twisted death these. clowns famed for their dark sense of humor. A unit of cute little robot bugs that, although oh, in my scarabs. opinion are frankly adorable, this belies their true nature as a voracious little monster that does some terrible things with your body after they finish murdering you. We're also going to talk about a particularly disturbing creation of the Drukari homunculi that is summarized as, quote, a floating organ harvester and well, I mean, a mobile torture. Chamber. All you had to say was so dark out yourself in for that one because whatever it is is a given. We're going to be talking about all that in this video and a whole lot more. But before we dive headfirst into the grim dark. Unless you're brand new to this channel, you've probably noticed that I wear the same kind so, yeah, of stylish I'm down for that new series that goes over all these different make. units and now stuff like that. And company called Into the explaining Age, more why the they're, of this you know, video. dark and stuff these like that. That's pretty cool, you know? They're super soft, shrink and I enjoy his, uh, have just the right amount of stretch, you know, and they're also horror, a little bit longer than a unsolved, unexplained so mystery videos are always some of my favorites, so. And Into the AM's got something I'll definitely, yeah. They make Definitely looking photos, forward to that new series he's doing. Prints, and a ton of other cool stuff as well. They've easily got hundreds of designs to choose from, and I promise you, you're not going to find shirts this cool anywhere else on the internet. If you're the type of person that likes your clothing to fit well and be super comfortable, but you're not into flashy designs, no problem. Into the AM's got a whole line of basic tees as well that are just as stylish and comfy, but without the extra flash. And they don't just make shirts either, as these all-day pants are easily some of the most comfortable and stylish ones that I own. They sent me a pair to try out, and I honestly couldn't be happier with them. If you want to upgrade your wardrobe with some of these amazing shirts or some of these all-day pants, then head on over to IntoTheAM.com by clicking on my link in the description down below or use code WESHAMMER at checkout yeah. to save 10% off your entire order. And remember, my code works site-wide, so if you combine that with bundle packs or items in the on-sale section, you can save even more. A huge thank you to Into the AM cool. for being such a loyal supporter of this channel and for sponsoring this video. Some of those don't look now, too bad. back to the Grimdark. Number five. The Arco Flagellants. Uh, I think we can all agree oh, that yes. servitors are probably one of the most disturbing things in all of Warhammer 40k. But what do you if you're mean? the franchise and you don't really know what they are, I'll give you the gist. For the most part, they are criminals that have been lobotomized and turned into cyborg servants. Their bodies are pumped full of life-preserving cocktails to keep them from decaying so they can stay in service for hundreds of years. Because the Imperium doesn't consider them to actually be people, they would be used for Not all anymore. kinds of dangerous tasks that would be inhumane for normal workers to be assigned to, such as working in highly radioactive environments. So I'm kind of surprised but they haven't made like a unit you can think of. 
from security jobs, factory work, since they can have guns and stuff and like that. The more I think arcoflagellants just basically all, all kinds of crazy melee based. I believe they are. In the novel, the I'm surprised skull, they haven't made example, like a unit one such servitor that has ranged, you know, throw some guns on them and the off you go, you and know? Yes, whatever you're picturing when I say a lobotomized criminal pump full of life preserving chemicals and turns into a happy go lucky clown, it's just as horrifying <laughs> as you're imagining. But thankfully, it only sometimes breaks down into fits of psychopathic rage. So it's definitely safe to let your kids play with this thing. Although incredibly rare and something that is traditionally only hinted at in the stories, there is substantial evidence to suggest that a lot of people that end up being turned into servitors still remain sentient, but no longer have control over their own body, which I'm not going to lie is pretty dark. The Arcoflagellants are a type Gattis. of servitor that has a lot in common with the other ones, but they differ in a couple of key ways. First and foremost, their primary purpose is for combat, and yep. are traditionally utilized by the Ecclesiarchy and the Sisters of Battle. But they have been requisitioned by the Inquisitors in the past. In addition to the lobotomization and other Ooh. necessary surgeries to turn a person into a servitor, the Arcoflagellants so undergo terrifying. an extended program of surgical modification, including face. muscle grafts, combat drug injectors, and cybernetically implanted weaponry. Most of them will even have both of their arms removed and replaced with electrified flails. Now, and I believe they do that all while the person is still awake. The mind will be reprogrammed into a constant state of berserk killing frenzy. Everything that made that individual who they were in life is destroyed and replaced only with an existential need to destroy the enemies of the God Emperor. Now, seeing as trying to transport a bunch of drugged up, frothing berserker zombies into combat zones across the galaxy would pose a serious risk of bodily injury to anyone in their vicinity, the Arcoflagellants are kept in a pacified state through their aptly named pacifier helmets. Yeah, just kind of like flood their mind with a barrage of safety freeze them. I mean, can't you freeze them like um, uh, what's that assassin? Um. I can't I can't think of the name of the um uh the assassin. I'm thinking of um uh Brookie's video, you know. Um when they want to use them, they unfreeze them, drop them in, and that's when you want nothing to come back alive. All right, you know, send them in, you know, defrost them and send them in. Uh, I'm surprised they just don't well, I mean, depends on how big the unit and stuff like that is, that'd probably be a lot, but you know, like you were saying, the pacifier the helmet, so is saturating their brains with the dogmatic teachings of the Imperial Creed. This unrelenting bombardment of holy imagery renders them unresponsive to outside stimuli. When the moment comes for them finally to be released into battle, their controller uses an activation word to terminate the flow of tranquil hymns while simultaneously activating their combat drug injectors. These things fill their body with a cocktail of stimulants designed to turn them into a fearless killing machine that exists only to destroy. They can't be reasoned with, they don't feel pain, and they won't stop murdering until they are utterly and completely destroyed as they barely even register grievous injuries that would kill a normal human combatant. What's particularly disturbing about them to me is that the people who are turned into these things are criminals and sinners that the Ecclesiarchy believes could be redeemed. That through holy butchery of his oh, enemies, the sin yeah, could be just like, um, by the Emperor and allowed back into his holy life. Penitent engines. Death. They are quite literally penitents, individuals seeking forgiveness in the eyes of their God by atoning for their previous sins and transgressions. But more specifically, as their name would imply, they are based off of the Flagellants, a medieval religious oh, sect that publicly yeah, beat and whipped themselves to atone for their sins. In the grim dark future, however, this idea has been inversed. We got to bump it up a the little bit. Have been turned instead against the enemies of mankind. However, unlike the Flagellants of old Terra, these guys didn't get a choice in the matter. They didn't choose to seek penance. It was something that was forced upon them by those in positions of power. Now, even though the Ecclesiarchy oh, no. is We're claiming gonna that this is all about forgiveness, whether you like it or not, just trust a bunch of you can be redeemed. You will be redeemed. Training. Oh no, it's far no, more no, I don't from be. their perspective well, to just lobotomize all of them and pump them full of combat drugs before throwing them into the meat grinder of war. I guess by the time of the 41st millennium, the church has decided that saying a couple of Hail Marys and going to confession once a week, it just wasn't grimdark enough. No. Now, taking living criminals, lobotomizing them into murder machines that have to be pacified through religious songs is definitely messed up. But I promise you, it's nowhere near as disturbing as the next unit we're going to talk but about. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised they haven't Number made four, um, servitors with guns to the Xenos be a unit. Known as the Talos Pain Engines 
are creations of the Dark Eldar homunculi covens, and are said to be the pinnacle of pain-based engineering. These things are incredibly well equipped, with a wide array of both melee and ranged weapons, including macro scalpels, chain flails, and spewing funnels that can render their enemies down into a bubbling pile of gore. On the defensive side, the Talos is enclosed in a hard metal shell, rendering them immune to all but the strongest of firearms. But when a wound is inflicted, their pain-obsessed minds do not see this as any kind of deterrent. If anything, pain only excites them into even further deranged and murderous so fugue it's states. Kind of like Although nobody would argue Dark that they're Eldar's not version of effective death dealing machines, combat is not actually their primary function. Their reason for existing being something altogether darker. The pain oh. engines are in fact a combination flesh harvester and mobile torture chamber that exist to uh. harvest the organs of those their masters have taken a particular interest in. After they manage to capture a victim, they will use their wide array of surgical implements to draw out each constituent part into itself, stripping and rendering down the victim's physical form layer by layer until nothing is left but a few drops of blood, every piece of their grotesque harvest being categorized and stored away to be brought back to their master. And to say this is a terrifying way to die is a massive understatement, what as the pain mean? engines are designed to subject their victims to a level of suffering thought impossible by mortals every kill fully utilizing millions of years of suffering-based research. In fact, these abominations in a sense are fueled by the agony they inflict, often keeping their victims alive as long as possible. After their grizzly Jesus. process is complete, they return to the field of battle with renewed vigor, searching for more prey. It's as if they recharge their batteries by inflicting pain. Now, after the battle is complete, or in some cases, once the pain engines have what they came to collect, they will return to their masters to hand over their grotesque collection. The master homunculus will then use each gathered ingredient to craft ever more terrifying elixirs, potions, Just imagine and poison, being targeted. which they will then in turn That's sell to cute. the highest bidders within Kimura. Every specimen has its purpose, every ingredient an array of unique properties. Musculature, nervous tissue, bones, etc, etc, each can be used to make a million different concoctions, while the emotions absorbed into the flesh at the time of the creature's death can be extracted and fashioned into esoteric and deadly weapons. Now, don't get it twisted. Fighting against a Drukhari invasion is a hellish experience for the armed forces of the Imperium. But at the end of the day, if I'm trying to imagine myself in that situation, there are still humanoid combatants that although may be truly sadistic, they don't really induce the fear of the unknown or a sense of true alien terror, at least for me. Okay. However, that all goes right out the window when you look up at the sky and see thousands of pain engines, an entire army of organ thieves descending on their grav shoots to abduct new victims. I'm pretty confident that that's the moment where I'd be like, you know what, nah. I'm, I'm just gonna see myself out if you catch my drift. Oftentimes with the pain engines, it's not just enough for them to bring back a big bag of gore to their home oh. master. Oh no, a bunch of blood and guts has very That's little- That's like some Hellraiser level stuff right there. A disciplined and well-studied homunculus. Such common ingredients oh. are left to their lessers within the coven. The masters of pain themselves often require hyper-specific samples. The targets they send the pain engines after can take a wide array of different forms, limited only by the cruel imaginations of their masters. Sometimes they will demand the pain engines only harvest guardsmen who witness their entire squad being massacred. Now, other times, they send them after individuals of particular rank, such as an esteemed captain, the veteran of the Hundred Wars, or a planetary governor. And fun fact, there's At actually point, a whole bunch I'm of different types necrohunt. of Talos pain engines utilized by different homunculi covens. The ones that always stood out to me, for example, were the ones made what by is pain? <laughs> you see, these homunculi don't just see themselves as scientists, but true artists of pain, which admittedly is a common sentiment amongst the arrogant homunculi, but the others tend to strike more of a balance between art and science, where these guys go all in on the art direction. Each and every one of their pain engines is equipped with a potent toxin patented by their masters that is made from the rendered flesh of worm-like creatures known as nyctovermins. After the pain engine has injected their victim, the toxin will immediately begin to replicate inside of their body, manifesting in dark and leprous like, should be like if this is like as well as hard dark Eldar level stuff. Orbs. Shortly and they're doing this the to keep Slanesh away? Like, there should be some, like, Slanesh stuff that's like... Chrysalis. The pain engine will scoop them up and then bring them back to the homunculi. Way worse. Them with the utmost care in order to adorn their grotesque Like, you need power. to do this to keep Slanesh away. No mistake, this, yeah, this is, is pretty brutal. We're talking about. So, Slanesh the should have... Is still alive. 
yet unable to move as they have essentially miles beyond like worse statue. stuff and the worst part is the toxin isn't done with them yet inside of their body a new clutch of nictovermids will begin to grow chewing through flesh and bone before finally bursting out in a geyser of fetid liquid the horrific display being met with rounds of polite applause from the gallery's audience Okay, deranged artists that are obsessed with pain and suffering and create living flying torture chambers to abduct their victims is admittedly pretty grimdark. So let's shift gears and talk about something a little lighter, something that's far too adorable to be secretly terrifying. Number three, the Necron Scarabs. Okay, so the last few entries were kind of grimdark, so let's take a minute to cleanse ourselves of all that negativity and focus on something that couldn't possibly be scary. The adorable Necron Scarabs. Aww. I mean, just look at these little guys. The little metal bug so boys whose primary purpose is to repair their Necron friends and build stuff. They're a bunch of great little guys that always try to do their best. Now for the Necrons, these things act like something of a utility unit and can do a little bit of everything from reconnaissance to battlefield repair, and if enough of them gather together, they can't even hold their own in a fight. They're like what would happen if you mix together a medic, an engineer, a mechanic, an architect, a 3D printer, and a can of WD-40 all in one, and then you gave it a bunch of cute little legs and the ability to fly around. In fact, their primary purpose Scarab is the construction and, and uh, deconstruction of matter. They're able to render down literally any substance in the galaxy into its base components, which they can then use to build anything their controller could possibly want. The Scarabs understand that recycling is important, and thus do it at a molecular level. Are you a Necron overlord or a Cryptek and you need more gauze rifles for your warriors? No problem. Just let the Scarabs chow down on a bunch of broken war engines and discarded armor and have them start churning out a bunch of shiny new guns. Need to build a bridge but don't have any metal components lying around for your Scarabs to break apart? And no worry, just send them boys to render down the corpses of your slain enemies and build a bridge out of their flesh, bones, and the iron sucked right out of their blood. Okay, so maybe the scarabs are not nearly as cute as okay. they led you to believe. Now, one on one, a scarab is no match for a human combatant, but well, they're right. almost never alone. In fact, as was demonstrated in the novel Belisarius Call, The Great Work, the scarabs have been observed utilizing their gathered material to churn out even more scarabs, rapidly multiplying from a small handful into an unrelenting swarm. There have been numerous documented sightings of swarms of scarabs gathering together in such inconceivable numbers that they literally block out the sun before descending upon the battlefield in an all-consuming tide of chittering metallic That's a pretty intense picture. A sizable swarm of these things is capable of overwhelming imperial defenses and dismantling all of their fortifications. They move like a metallic living carpet that consumes everything in sight. Human fighters get dragged underneath, kicking and screaming, as the scarabs relentlessly break them down, molecule by agonizing molecule. Ooh. Even heavily armored vehicles offer no shelter from the swarm, as they latch on to their armor forms and ferociously burrow inside to feed on the trapped and terrified crew. Oh, I'm not going to lie to you, as somebody who was personally traumatized by the bugs in the Brendan Fraser mummy movie when I was a kid, oh, these things yeah. triggered that particular existential feeling of dread in me that's difficult to put into words. And oh yeah, fun fact, the scarabs don't just come in one flavor of awful. There's all different types that are each more terrifying than the last. Oh. There are, for example, the mind shackle scarabs that are a specialized variant designed to hijack the brain of sentient species by burrowing inside of their head and bypassing all of their cerebral functions. And sometimes their influence will be Jesus. so subtle that the individual may not even realize they've got a parasite. The scarab's mental commands just sort of nudging them here or there into a specific course of actions that benefit the Necrons, but aren't out of line for their particular character and don't raise any red flags. Whereas other times, if the Scarab's controller amps them up to full power, everyone that's got one of these things in their brain will be forced to obey their command, turning against their allies, sabotaging key resources and that's defense insane. systems, or turning into a whole bunch of sleeper agents ready to assassinate marked individuals deemed a threat by the Overlord. There's also the flensing scarabs, who lose the ability to deconstruct metal and instead are specialized to deal with organic matter. Each of their legs is outfitted with a monomolecular sharp flensing blade that they utilize to violently separate flesh from bone. Like a swarm of metallic flying piranhas, that these little bastards can render a guardsman unit into a quivering pile of viscera and gore in mere seconds. Ugh. But in my personal opinion, the most terrifying form of scarab is by far the blood swarm nanoscarabs, which are far smaller than a normal scarab and are exclusively used by Emotech the Stormlord. 
When unleashed, they fly out across the battlefield and descend like a swirling red mist, frantically probing the armor of the Storm Lord's enemies for an exploitable flaw. Once one has been located, they will frantically begin to burrow through the armor plating or joint seals until they encounter flesh, which they will then begin to rip and tear at, creating lacerating wounds that refuse to clot. Oh. This excessive amount of blood spilling acts like a homing beacon for the terrifying cannibalistic entities and then you known can't, as the flayed Because you got the armor and you can't through get at it. To descend upon the marked victims. Ugh. At the end of the day, the scarabs prove to me that in the grim darkness of the far future, even the things that at first seem cute are actually designed to kill you in the that's, most horrific ways imaginable. That, but let's shift gears you for know, a Even if there's like a small little thing, you know, no way, shape, right in your armor, you can't get at it. A unit that is not it. only horrifying to fight against, but the reality of what they actually are is far darker. Number two the pox walkers. Oh. When it comes to quantifying just how many aliens, yeah, demons, Nurgle. and cultures abominations exist within the 41st and 42nd millennium, That's I believe a cool the thing. technical term used That's for this cool is a metric shit ton. And a lot of them are suspiciously recognizable as classic monster tropes that we're all familiar with. But in Warhammer's defense, they've all got that special grimdark twist that makes them the best kind of distinct, mm -hmm. legally distinct. Ghosts, demons, Frankensteins, Draculas, they're all here. And of course, it should come as no surprise that there are also a ton of different types of zombies prowling the Milky Way galaxy. From the abominations unleashed by the curse of unbelief, to the dried out husks of the unquenched in the deserts of Vaporous, the cannibalistic shadow kiff of the abandoned world of Sanctuary, the plague zombie turned demons vile savants, the list just goes on and on. But the one that has always stood out to me as by far the creepiest are the creatures known as Poxwalkers. You see, the appropriately named Especially zombie plague smiles. actually comes in thousands of different variants and has been used by both the Death Guard Traitor Legion and the Cults of Nurgle as a weaponized pathogen for thousands of years. Why kick off an invasion yourself when you can unleash a plague that turns your enemies against each other, softening them up for when you do decide to take to the field yourself? Smart. Some of the documented zombie plagues include the Weeping, the Slithering, the Grey Tears, and the Mutterflux, just to name a few. However, there is one that stands apart from the others as it is not a plague in and of itself, but rather something that tends to manifest during a Death Guard's invasion when the cocktail of hundreds if not thousands of plagues they unleash all come together and mutate into a horrifying disease known as the walking pox. This pox differs from other variants of zombie plague in that as soon as the victim becomes infected, their body will immediately begin to rot and decay as if they had already died. It will Ugh. also induce a grotesque metamorphosis, wherein bloated and tentacles will burst out all over their body, their bones will crack and elongate, and horn-like growths will burst from their skulls. Rigor mortis will begin to set in in the victim's face, and it will be fused into a permanent, wide-eyed, rictus grin. Needless to say, this is a horrifyingly painful way to die, and there's no cure for it. It has a 100% fatality rate. As with all zombie plagues, after the disease finally kills the infected person, their body will begin to reanimate into a shuffling monster, driven forward by a simple desire to spread the walking pox to as many people as possible. These creatures are known as poxwalkers, and they will be drawn together in their thousands, quickly overwhelming a city's defenses. Unlike with the scarabs, the poxwalker is a sufficient threat in and of itself. The plague has mutated their muscles to be far stronger than they were in life, and they are virtually immune to physical attacks. They don't feel pain, and bullets and blades do nothing to slow them down. Jesus. To the unprepared defenders, a horde of these things may be enough to take down an entire world if left uncontained. And containing the walking pox is vastly more difficult than quarantining off any other zombie plague, as it's not only transferred through bodily contact or the inhalation of airborne contaminants, but also through sound. When the pox walkers gather together oh, in mass, sound. the mindless groaning that they generate swells into a cacophony of plague-induced madness. This horrifying, monotonous white noise not only generates a supernatural wave of dread, panic, and fear that spreads in all directions, but it also acts as a vector to transmit the walking pox across sound waves. That's, With their loyalties completely that's changed, pretty intense. the pox walkers gather together in a huge horde that is capable of overrunning enemy lines, ripping, gnawing, and bludgeoning their former allies apart in an orgy of mindless violence. And sure, that's what's scary about being turned into any kind of zombie not just the certainty that there is no cure and you will die once you become infected, but that you know after it happens, your corpse is going to rise up and attack all the people that you care about. The walking box, however, differs in one key terrifying way. 
Somehow, in a remarkably cruel and demonic twist of fate, although the disease does kill the victim's body, somehow it leaves their mind intact. Of their course. consciousness only turning off for a brief moment at the time of their death before turning back on as the corpse reanimates. It is at this point, however, that they have lost all control over their own body and will be forced so to be like a servitor. To all of Just the atrocious and unforgivable acts the plague is about to commit. It is said that in battle, one of the hardest things about fighting against the Poxwalkers is that when you look into their tear-filled eyes, you're looking through a window into their soul. You know that this person, this loved one, friend, or brother, or sister, doesn't want to do what it's doing. Still in there, frantically screaming and pleading for the nightmare to end, as they are forced to watch as their own body devours those they have pledged their lives to defend. In conclusion, the Poxwalkers are by far the most disturbing type of zombie. Okay, I think these are gonna be like not just the because top of what they are one and what they represent in this the set. The idea of being conscious after you've been turned into one of these things and you're forced to watch as you commit all kinds of atrocities just adds a whole nother layer of disturbing to them. But the next unit we're going to talk about goes in the complete opposite direction, as not only do they eliminate their targets in a pretty horrific manner, but they view what they do as ironically hilarious. Number one, the Death Jesters. If you don't know much about okay. the group of Eldar known as the Harlequins, you can think of them as a group of performers that act out their ancient race's mythic history by blending the arts and acrobatics of theater with the brutality of war. They view their fighting style like a lethal dance that is as much a spectacle to behold as it is deadly and precise. Each of the Harlequins within a unit known as a troop play a role derived from a pivotal event, character, or god in Eldar history, specifically surrounding the fall of their civilization. The Death Jesters, as they have come to be known, take on the role of Death himself in the Harlequin performance. And okay. these aren't your run-of-the-mill clowns that like to juggle balls and pull rabbits out of hats. Oh no, <laughs> these guys juggle with fate itself and pluck the souls out of their enemies with precision shots from their dreaded Shrieker cannons. In combat, they fill the role of a long-range support unit, but yeah, whereas like other snipers. snipers may seek to maintain a low profile and pick off their targets one by one as discreetly as possible, the Death Jesters turn every kill into a spectacle of gore, every fired shot telling a story that ends in a bombastic and often grotesque punchline. These guys are absolute psychopaths, lunatics infamous for their dark and twisted sense of humor. Whereas other individuals living within the grimdark future may see the brutality of war as a grim necessity for their species' survival, the Death Jesters laugh in the face of death and hmm, revel in the damage they inflict. But for obvious reasons, other Eldari view them with a mixture of fear and disdain, as they don't see any humor in the deranged ways the Death Jester kills. What but about the, the Dark Death Eldar? Perspective, what do they, they think of them? is a permanent reminder of Death's cruel, unpredictable, and oftentimes ironically hilarious nature. In a sense, they believe they have gained enlightenment through embracing the. Yeah, I wonder what Dark Eldar existence. think of them. They're always seeking new and inventive ways to terrorize their victims, making sure every single kill is special and done in the most hilarious way possible. This can take the form of executing a general at the crescendo of his rallying speech to the horror of all of the troops under their command. Or in another instance, they may attempt to use precision fire to scare a group of individuals into fleeing for their lives through a minefield that they just finished setting up. Other times, their target may be aware of the Death Jester's presence and be fleeing in terror. They've got the shot lined up, but they don't take it until the last possible moment, wherein the victim seemingly escapes behind shutting blast doors. Right before the doors close, they will be struck with a round of explosive ammunition that causes not only the death of the target, but ends up splattering the walls and all of their terrified allies inside with their bloody remains. Ooh. And speaking of exploding ammunition, we have to intense. talk about the Death Jester's signature weapon, the Shrieker Cannon. Now, okay. this thing is an upgraded version of the Eldari Shuriken Cannon that has a much longer range and far more deadly ammunition, every single shot being filled with a virulent toxin known as Margrek. After the weapon is fired, the spinning disc that is unleashed from it will use centrifugal force to force the toxin out through microscopic holes in the projectile's surface. After impact, the toxin will mix with the victim's genetic material and cause a deadly chain reaction, wherein tissue and organs will begin to rapidly twist and distort. The toxin will then quickly work its way through the victim's body until it reaches their brain, wherein it will induce a violent sense of delirium. They will lose control over their body as their blood begins to boil, their organs Ugh. begin to rupture one by one, and their flesh ignites from within. Before they even know what's happening, their body will self-destruct in an explosion of viscera and gore, becoming a living Ugh, frag grenade, Jesus. wherein a torrent of bone shrapnel will be propelled in every direction, 
lacerating and maiming any other unlucky individuals. Yeah, in how does that work against Tyranids? In a cruel twist of fate, often the people the victim ran to for help. I wonder if it works the same way on Tyranids. That sought to treat their wounds. Any survivors that are left will often be standing there in complete and utter shock, trying to make sense of what just happened. And their only clue will be the maniacal laughter from the unseen death jester and the faint sound of mocking applause. And that was five of Warhammer 40K's most disturbing units. Which one do you think is the creepiest? Are you like me and you have an aversion to burrowing, flesh-eating bugs so the scarabs rank at the top for you? Or do you think being stalked by a death jester would be far more terrifying? I kind of think of the pox walkers. Do you know creepy, disturbing, or scary units in 40K that you'd love to hear me cover in another video like this? In between my horror story videos and my deep dives, I like to relax a bit by doing some fun list type videos that don't take dozens of hours to research. So this is probably going to become another series that I end up doing a few more parts to, as let me tell you. I look forward to it. If there's anything 40K is not lacking, it's creepy and disturbing units and characters. Mm, Anyways, that's all I've got for you today. Big thanks to everyone that supports the work that I do, and I'll catch y'all in the next one. Okay, I'm looking forward to this new series. I like these type of videos. Um, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to part two and what the hell is in that. I mean, some of these were really messed up. Actually, they all were pretty disturbing and messed up. You know, Arcoflagellants, the Talos Pain Engines, uh, the Scarabs were very disturbing. All the Poxwalkers were pretty, I don't know, pretty brutal. I mean, just imagine, you know, being a servitor and, you know, being lobotomized and you know, doing things that your body doesn't do, even though it might be, you know, some sort of meaningless task or something like that. Go and change, you know, this this fuel cell or something, you know, something something like that. And you know, but being a pox walker, well, now you're kind of doing the same thing, except now you're spreading like disease and plague and rot and stuff like that. So that's. That, that's pretty pretty brutal and pretty insane and stuff like that all while still being conscious too so yeah that's mm. scarabs were pretty intense too you know especially those what blood ones and stuff like that that will find a, a chink in your armor and you know go in through there find a weak spot and, and burrow in ugh uh, Death Jester is pretty insane stuff like that, you know. Um, they got some pretty brutal stuff there, you know. Firing a shot, making you run away through like a, a landmine they just, you know, set up and stuff like that. That's, you know, pretty brutal. Or waiting till like a general's just about done finishing his speech and then you kill him like right before he finishes. Uh, uh, like you said, you know, right when you're about to make it into safety through a blast door, nope, then you get killed. Um, yeah, I wonder what Dark Eldar think of these guys. Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. If Eldar kind of like, uh, you know, makes me wonder what Dark Eldar are about. Same thing with Dark Eldar. You know, these pain engines, those things are pretty intense and stuff like that. Like I was saying earlier during the video, it's like, they have to do this stuff to keep Solnesh happy. So there's gonna be like some other like Slanesh stuff that should be way worse, you know? So I'm kinda of curious, you know, because I know of, you know, some Slanesh things, but like I don't know like the lore, you know, of certain Slanesh things, so yeah. And then of course the flagellants and stuff like that pretty brutal pretty intense and stuff like that uh, like I said I'm surprised they haven't made you know like an army of servitors with guns since flagellants are mostly melee based and stuff like that I don't know send these guys against the pox walkers yeah there you go alright so anyways there we go there is the video the Darkest Units in 40k Part 1. Oof. I can only imagine what's going to be in Part 2. I'm looking forward to that. So, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the thumbs up button. That'd be awesome. Let me know um, which unit do you think out of these, what was it, four or five of them, um, is the darkest and why.
let me know. And, um, yeah, other than that, you know, feel free to subscribe to my channel, follow me on social media, links in the description box below. And other than that, just stick around, more videos are on the way, and I will see you guys next time.